Um, so uh, I have the privilege of welcoming one of our amazing staff members, the uh, wonderful Tim Burr. So wherever you are, why don't you give him a quick whoop and a cheer? This guy is amazing. His passion for Jesus, his heart for the word, and so I'm excited for what Tim's going to share with us today. So Tim, thank you. Thanks, Pete. Okay, I thought the best way to start would be to pray. So Father, I thank you for everyone who's watching, wherever they are, um, whatever they might be doing right now. And Lord, I pray that today, that for everyone watching, that wherever they're at, that today that they would hear your word to them, your specific word for them right now, today. And Lord, I'm, I'm just a human, a human being. I can't do anything. But Lord, you can do all things. And so I pray that you would do your great work today. That you would speak to the people watching and listening and bring new life. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, so hi everyone. How are you doing today? Hope you are well. Um, my name is Tim and I'm part of the team here at Ivy Church. And we're in our series called Get Fruity, which I think is a great title. Um, Context is everything, right? And uh, we're going to be looking at, well, we're looking at over these last few weeks, the fruit of the Spirit. So what are the fruit of the Spirit? Well, the fruit of the Spirit is the evidence of the work of the Spirit of God in the life of a person and the community of people who follow Jesus. It's not a list of things you have to try really, really hard and be better at doing. That's not it at all. If the, if the message ever comes across, you just need to try harder. Either we've totally missed it, or you have. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, is firstly, it's a description of the character of God. If you want to know what God is like, this is a great way of seeing. It's a description of the character of God. Which means that secondly, it is a description of the work that God wants to do in your life and in my life to make us look more like him. I don't know if you know this, but Jesus wants you to become like him. It's absolutely amazing. The fruit of the Spirit is a description of the work that God wants to do in your life and in my life to make us more like him. Now this is helpful because if we know what it is that God wants to do in our lives then it gives us the opportunity to go along with it, right? And as we do that, we'll see the fruit grow. So how does it actually happen? Well, it's not through just trying really hard to be a, a good person, but it's by faith in Jesus. It's by trusting in him to do that in us through the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is his gift to any person that believes in him. Now, you might be new to all of this. and wondering, Tim, well, what the heck is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit... It's the gift of God in you and in me. God can't be separated from what he gives. God gives himself to you. His love, his power, all wrapped up in the person of the Holy Spirit. It's pretty amazing, right? The Holy Spirit is actually what makes Christian life possible. Without the Holy Spirit, it's totally impossible and so that's why the Bible says to us again and again, be filled with the Spirit, be filled with the Spirit, be filled with the Spirit. God wants to fill you with his Spirit every single day so that you would be empowered to live a life that reflects Jesus. Now, as those fruit grow and as the work of the Spirit grows in your life and my life, one of the ways it will show is in gentleness. Okay, so that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. Gentleness. I mean if that's okay with you. I'm just joking. Okay, so the Greek word for the fruit of the Spirit is proutes. Say that with me, proutes. It's a great word. It actually occurs a few times in the New Testament. Sometimes it gets translated as gentle, and sometimes it gets translated as meek. So I wonder for you, as you hear those words, what comes to mind? What do you think of when you hear the words gentle, or meek? Why don't you tell us in the chat or in the comments if you're on Facebook? Now, being really honest, when I think of gentle or meek, I probably naturally think of someone who's just very nice, maybe just a bit quiet, and they, they never say no to anything that I ask them to do, and maybe, you know, they're not really too pushy, but they're just nice to have around, and maybe a bit of a pushover. They don't really disagree with you about anything. You can kind of get away with murder around them. 
Meek sounds weak, right? Well, the Cambridge Dictionary actually defines meek as, and I quote, as quiet and unwilling to disagree or to fight to strongly support personal ideas and opinions. Synonyms of gentle and meek in our culture are things like timid, mild, bland, weak, and unambitious. Do you want to be meek? To be honest, that sounds like the exact opposite of what we want people to be today. We want people to speak their mind and stand up for what they believe in and fight with anyone who disagrees. Who would want to be gentle? Um, I love this quote from Coco Chanel, the French designer and businesswoman. She said, gentleness doesn't get work done unless you happen to be a chicken laying an egg. (laughs) What is going on here? But Jesus said, the meek will inherit the earth. The meek will inherit the earth. So what is going on? Well, the Bible talks about gentleness and meekness in a completely different way. The word that we translate gentleness and meekness, proutes, is used, was used in Greek culture to describe a horse that had been tamed and learned to accept a rider and respond to their commands. This process is known as being broken in. The horse is broken in. If a horse hasn't been broken in, they're not safe to ride and they're considered of little value. It's also used, it was also used to describe a dog that had been trained to defend and protect sheep and other animals instead of eating them. Do you get the kind of the sense of the picture that's emerging here? Gentleness and meekness is not about being a pushover or just being nice. It's so much more than that. Gentleness is exercising God's power under his control. God wants to put his power through you and through me. And the question is, can he trust you with his power? Is it safe for him to trust you with more? Let me use a little illustration. Okay, imagine that you and I are like this USB phone charger. Okay, how much can you power can you put through that? Well, about enough to charge a phone. But what about this? What about this cable? How much power do you think you could put through that? Well, you already know by looking at it that it's a lot more than this phone cable because of the amount of insulation. The more insulation there is, the more power that you can put through it. The wire carries the current, but the insulation makes it safe. It makes it safe to handle more power. So when it comes to thinking about power and God's power at work in your life and in my life, I'm not talking about our power. We're just the cable, remember. This is all about God's power. We're the connection. When God wants something to happen on earth, as it is in heaven, he wants to use us. It's like on one side, we're connected to God through the Holy Spirit. And on the other side, we're connected to the world and the people around us. And God wants to put his power through us to channel it through us. So the question is, how much power is it safe to put through us? Now, so gentleness is like the insulation, if you like. And in the Bible, it has two components, okay? The first is like the vertical aspect. That that firstly, gentleness is about humility before God, recognising who he is and who we are, and that actually we're totally dependent on him. We have no power apart from him. Without Jesus, we can do nothing. Now, the second aspect, the horizontal aspect, if you like, is patience with others. It's the knowing that we're just people, we're just human beings, that we're weak, that we're fallible, that we get things wrong, and that we're not perfect. It means that we're able to be patient and kind with others as we walk this journey together. So let's look at this a little bit closer. The power of God, what is it for? And how do we grow in gentleness? Well, the story that I want to use to kind of bring it to life for us today is from the book of Acts, And if this is all new to you, okay, the book of Acts comes after the four accounts of Jesus' life in the New Testament. At the beginning of the book of Acts, Jesus has been raised from the dead, he's been ascended into heaven, and he's poured out the Holy Spirit on his followers with great power. And it completely changed their lives. 
the Holy Spirit took a group of frightened, intimidated people and turned them into an unstoppable movement that took the good news of Jesus across the known world in the face of great hardship and persecution. It's extraordinary. But you know what? They were just ordinary people like you and me. And the whole of the rest of the book is about what those disciples go on and do in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's an amazing read. So the story we're going to look at today comes as the good news of Jesus has reached a place called Samaria for a man named Philip. The disciples, Peter and John, are sent down there to find out what on earth's going on. And they meet a guy there called Simon. And so I've asked uh, Rebecca, my lovely wife, to come up and to read this story for us. I'm going to move this out of the way so I don't trip over it. A reading from the book of Acts, chapter 8, verses 9 to 24. Now for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptised, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptised, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles that he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, give me also this ability so that everyone whom I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. Amazing. Thanks, Becky. Okay, I'll show some water. Okay, so this guy, Simon, he was kind of a big deal, okay? And he must have thought he was because he told everyone around him that he was the great power of God. I can imagine that slogan written on his wagon or whatever he had as he traveled around (laughs) but you can imagine his instagram page he had loads of followers people were really impressed with him totally taken in they really thought he was someone special and then philip comes along and he starts telling everyone about jesus loads of people come to faith and they're baptized including simon and he's amazed by the way that the power of the spirit of god is at work through philip and he starts he sees it and he's like i want a piece of that action now We know that that's what is in his heart because when Peter and John come and start praying for people to be filled with the Spirit, and we don't know exactly what's going on, but you know maybe there's some visible signs of what's happening as people receiving this gift from God. You know, in my experience, some people shake or cry as they experience the love of God and the compassion of God, or maybe they fall down or speak in other languages if they're not used to being in the presence of God. It's not always like really dramatic. But when power hits like this, as these guys are praying, and when we're plugged into that power, it can be. I know it was for me when I was filled with the Holy Spirit for the first time. It changed my life. Everyone's experience of the being filled with the Spirit is different, and you definitely don't need to be afraid of it. Now Simon sees what's going on, and he says, give it to me too. I will buy it from you. I want that from myself. I imagine that he thought it was pretty good business. You know, He would charge people to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and you could get, pay a little bit more to get free refills. But anyway, with this in mind, he's like, I can use this for my own benefit to make me look good. Simon wanted the power of God, but he had no idea what that power was for. Now, you might be wondering today, well, Tim, what is the power of God for? Why is it given? That's a really good question. Not long after Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit, he told everyone why. 
In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, you can read it. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is on me because, because what, Jesus? Because he has anointed me. But why? Why have you been anointed with the spirit, Jesus? And he says this, to proclaim good news to the poor, to send, proclaim me, to send me to proclaim freedom for the captives, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Look, the power of the Spirit is given so that we can tell other people the good news of Jesus in a hurting world. It, it is the power to bring freedom to people who are bound by evil forces, to bring healing to hearts, to minds and to bodies. You see that the power of God is given to serve let me say this again, it's so important. If you remember nothing else, remember this. The power of God is given to serve. When God came in the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the most powerful person that ever lived, he said this, I came not to be served, but to serve. Now, if we're honest, our ideas about what we think power are are much more like Simon than Jesus, naturally speaking. Normally, it's like, who gets to make the decisions? Who is in control? Who's at the top? Who gets their say? Who gets their way? And it's obtained by a struggle and a fight. Now, the events of the last week, as we've witnessed the US election, really highlight this as we've watched Biden and Trump fight it out. Okay, going for a completely different illustration. For the Marvel fans out there, okay, think of Thanos and his struggle for power and control over the universe as he collects the Infinity Stones so that he could do what he thought was right without anyone stopping him. But the reality is that this thinking about power is not limited to the realms of politics or cinema. This, it affects our relationships, our marriages, how we engage in our workplaces and our leadership. And it can have such a negative impact on all of those relationships in those different places. When Jesus came, he turned this whole thing upside down. He said, there's another way. He said, if you want to become greatest of all, you must become servant of all. I wonder if he would have said to Simon, if you want to become the great power of God, then you must become the great servant of God. You see that the trajectory of Christian life is not up, 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 pushing others down, down, down. It's down, 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 raising others up, up, up. Now, when Peter and John heard Simon's request, they warned him to repent, saying that he's like, you've got no idea what you're asking for here. This ministry, and ministry means service, you're not right for it because you're not right before God. The Spirit is not a reward for the proud or the powerful. It's a gift to the humble and the powerless. Asking for the Spirit is a confession of weakness and dependence. It's saying, God, I need you. There's no room for pride. And it is given solely on the basis of God's kindness. You can't buy it, whatever currency you want to use. Simon thought that he could use it to make himself look good. And in the end, he would only use it to take advantage of people. Now, God wants to give you and me his power. The power is given to serve. How much power depends on the insulation of gentleness, humility before God, and patience with others. Now, before you get the idea that Peter and John had nailed this. They had learned this the hard way. They started out probably a lot like Simon in this story. But as they followed Jesus through their mistakes, through their misunderstandings, through their failures, they learned the way of Jesus. They learned the way of gentleness. Friends, gentleness is not weakness. It is not apathy. It is not being a pushover or just being nice. This fruit of the Spirit is God's power under his control in your life and in my life. It's about being absolutely determined to do what God is asking you to do and to do it with his help and in the way that he would go about it if he was you. Gentleness does not grasp at something for itself, try to control or manipulate. It's the power of God received in humility and exercised with great patience in the service of others. Jesus, in Matthew 11, summarises this beautifully. He says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Gentleness, we see in this passage, it's like it's the power to come alongside others, slowing down to match their pace, 
to walk with them, not to judge or to criticise from a distance, but to love and to serve up close. And through that process, God's power goes to work and a person's life is transformed. Now, I'm going to close in a minute, but I want to give you a couple of examples um, from my life, a really bad example and a really good example of what I'm talking about. I'm a bit of a perfectionist, okay, which means that I can be quite hard on myself and others. Now, earlier this year, I was working through a difficult situation uh, with another person, and I went into it feeling quite angry and a bit afraid as to how this whole thing was going to turn out. And I decided that something needed to happen, and it needed to happen right now. And, uh, it, and I wasn't prepared to think about how we were going to do this, how we were going to approach this. I was determined. And um, I didn't take the time to think about how that other person might be feeling and how they might be doing and to work through it with them. And, um, or think about how I was going to have the conversation. Now, you might not be surprised to hear that it just didn't go very well. Um, but thanks to the goodness of God, we managed to work it out in the long run. And I learned a lot about gentleness and patience through that quite painful experience. <laughs> I've learned a lot. Now let me give you a good example. A few years ago, I was in a really bad place financially. I'm so thankful for the work of CAP and that we support that ministry. And I was really scared of what would happen if people found out that I was struggling financially and if I was in debt. And eventually, I plucked up the courage to tell someone at work. And I was actually really scared about how it would affect my work. And I had no idea what that person was going to say. I was honestly terrified. But when I opened up to them, uh, they just said to me, oh, Tim, I'm so sorry to hear that. How can I help? And I was absolutely stunned. I, I was so surprised that that's what they said. And I was so relieved. You know, I found that, that because of that person's gentleness, I was able then to find the courage to tell the other people in my life that I need to talk to and start to make much better financial decisions. Can I invite uh, the band to come up? So it's kind of to bring this into land now. The journey of gentleness like the horse being broken in, is learning to submit to God, to his commands, to his direction, so that we're safe to be around, and so that God can use us in, with great power. Like the sheepdog, it's learning to protect and defend those that are weak, and not bite or attack them. How many people around us today are weak and struggling and need support? It's to work with the good shepherd by doing what he says and following his commands. Like the cable, it's allowing God to wrap us in humility and patience so that he can use us, so that he can trust us, trust you and trust me with more of his power and put more of it through you to serve others, to bring healing, to bring hope, to bring life in Jesus' name. You know, Peter and John learned gentleness through their failures and hardships because they learned through that to surrender to, the, to Jesus and his ways. Through that, they became, aware of their own, they became aware of their own pride, of their weakness and their need of God. And as a result, God trusted them with his power. And you know, I wonder if the times that we're going through like this are an opportunity for God to do this work of gentleness in our lives. Because it's in the difficulties, it's in the hardships, it's in the painful moments that we really learn to submit to God and to trust him and to let go of control. In that, we become aware of our weaknesses, of our shortcomings, of our character flaws. We see ourselves rightly and we get over thinking that we're any better than anybody else. We realise that we are wrong about our ideas about power. And yet we find that God has been getting us ready to put more of his power through us so we can make a difference together in the world. Now, the ultimate picture that we have of gentleness, it comes from the life of Jesus. The night before he was crucified, he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane and he knew what was going to happen the next day, that he was going to go to the cross to die for you and for me and the pain and the suffering that he would endure as part of that. And he prayed, God, take this away from me. And there was silence. And so he knelt down 
the Son of God, the creator of the universe, for whom and through whom all things were made, humbled himself, surrendered himself, and prayed the most powerful prayer that has ever been prayed in history. Not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. And the next day he went to the cross. He was crucified in weakness and humiliated. And he did that because God is patient with us. He does not judge us for our sin and our failures, but met us and has come to us in our weakness and brokenness and given his life for us there that we might find forgiveness and the power for new life in his name. Uh, Bernard of Clairvaux famously said this, who is there that can adequately gauge the greatness of the humility, gentleness and self-surrender revealed by the Lord of Majesty in assuming human nature and accepting the punishment of death and the shame of the cross? And yet that act of humility and patience is the most powerful act in human history. And it's how God, through that, gets all of the power that we need today. So I'm going to pray now as we finish. And I just want to invite you to pray, to ask for the receiving of the gift of the Holy Spirit, that God would come in and do his work in you so that he can do a great work through you. And just as a a response, maybe wherever you are, if you would be able to kneel, whether it's in your room, in your living room, or wherever you are, to kneel as a sign of humility, a sign of surrender to God. And just say, Lord, I want your Holy Spirit. Give me your power. Do your work in me. Surround me, wrap me with humility and patience that you could use me to bring healing to this world, to bring hope and new life in your name. So just as you're kneeling now, I'm going to pray for you and invite the Holy Spirit to come. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your great love for us. Thank you that you went to the cross for our sake, that we might find forgiveness and new life, that you surrendered yourself for our sake. And now, Lord, we want to surrender ourselves for your sake. And I want to pray and ask, Father, for the giving of the gift of your Holy Spirit for people that are kneeling now. Just where you are in your homes, Lord, I pray for the anointing of your Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. And I thank you for the gift of your Spirit. And Lord, I want to speak this as a word over everyone who's kneeling now. The Spirit of the Lord is upon you because he has anointed you. He has anointed you. Maybe just say that. He has anointed me. The Spirit of God is on me because he has anointed me. He has anointed you to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and to declare the year of the Lord's favour. Father, I pray for an outpouring of the power of your spirit for every single person, Lord, that you would fill them with your power, that they might be a part, Lord, and that we together might be a part of your healing work, your restoring work, your redeeming work that you want to do in our generation, in our time, Father. And I pray, Lord, for an outpouring of the gift of your Holy Spirit, that we would walk in the fullness of that. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to hand over to Louise, and they're going to lead us in this song. And it's a great prayer, inviting God to do a great work in us.